Hello, and thank you for joining us for episode 80 of the Aviation News Talk podcast, where we bring you general aviation news and safety tips that pilots and student pilots like you can use. Today, we're talking with a pilot who's on track to go from zero time to airline pilot in just one year. We'll also talk about the Piper M series of cabin class aircraft and the Pilatus PC-12. Plus, coming up in the news, Operation Airdrop is back in the news in the wake of Hurricane Michael. And a well-known jet manufacturer has gone from bankruptcy to finding a new investor to keep it afloat in less than a week. And speaking of jets, Cessna has just inked a deal for 325 jets, and we'll tell you who's buying them. And a helicopter pilot was arrested in upstate New York, and we'll tell you why. And the airlines in a country that is legalizing marijuana this week put their employees on notice. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about general aviation. I'm Max Trescott. I'm here to educate and inform you and hopefully have a little fun. Along the way, I'll be sharing my over 40 years of experience as a pilot, author of the G-1000 Glass Cockpit Handbook, and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. I'm also a specialist in Cirrus aircraft, like the SR-20, SR-22, and the SF-50 Vision Jet. So if you're thinking about buying one of these aircraft or would like some training in one, please call me now for a free consultation and possibly a free demo flight. And if you're new to the show, we typically do a weekly news-oriented show, including listener feedback and answers to questions. And occasionally we do an interview show. Last week in episode 79, we interviewed a dozen pilots attending the AOPA show in Carbondale, Illinois. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. All this and more, and the news starts now. From Alligator.org, which is the student newspaper of the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida, comes a story about students and faculty who are helping out Operation Airdrop. Now, on Saturday and Sunday, Operation Airdrop delivered about 27,000 pounds of essential supplies, such as non-perishable foods, water, batteries, bug sprays, diapers, and toothpaste, with more than 50 private planes from the University Air Center at the Gainesville, Florida Airport. The goal of the operation was to help those who couldn't receive supplies because of blocked roads from the effect of Michael, according to Trey Thriffoli, a board member of Operation Airdrop. Now, Operation Airdrop started in 2017 when Hurricane Harvey hit Texas, said Ethan Garrity, a board member and VP of Government Relations for Operation Airdrop. Since then, the charity has helped with three other hurricanes, including Irma, Maria, and Florence. There's no financial incentive for pilots, Garrity said. It helps to just justify and validate aviation and why it's so important. Pilots delivered supplies to devastated Florida cities, some of which included Apalachicola, Port St. Joe, Bluntstown, Bristol, Tallahassee, and Panama City, according to Thriftfully. He says the operation will continue through Tuesday night of this week. In these cities, two out of every three trees are knocked over or snapped in half and buildings are in ruins, he said. There's people who haven't seen a FEMA truck. They're out in the woods in North Florida, and people are realizing still today that they need everything. Now, Marsha Hodick, an employee of the University of Florida Department of Neurosurgery and a volunteer, said, We need the Gator Nation to step up because we were spared. She said, We know what it's like to be stuck in the middle of a hurricane. As of this recording, on late Tuesday, October the 16th, the Operation Airdrop Facebook page indicates that donations and flights were still continuing today. If you want to help, go to Facebook and type in Operation Airdrop and then select Hurricane Michael. We'll also have a link to Operation Airdrop's Facebook page, which you can find in our show notes on the podcast player of your smartphone. And late last week, there was a story from AOPA that said that Alan Klatmeyer's One Aviation had filed for bankruptcy. But earlier this week, AviationWeek.com reported that a Chinese investor has rescued Eclipse and will be buying the company. U.S.-based City King International stepped in after One Aviation Corporation, which owns Eclipse Aerospace and Kestrel Aircraft, gave up its cash flow struggle and voluntarily filed for Chapter 11, allowing a reorganization plan that will position the company for the future. City King is a U.S. financial entity set up by a Chinese group to complete the deal, said One Aviation CEO Alan Klatmar. Quote, there's money behind them in China, he said. The Chinese group has been an investor since last October and has been seeking an acquisition. They're not a short-term finance source through bankruptcy. They're the long-term buyer. Now, while the bankruptcy court decides to approve One Aviation's reorganization plan, which concludes a post-Chapter 11 debt of $17 million, Klattmeyer says, quote, it's business as usual here. Warranties are being honored. Airplanes are being serviced. It will improve the ability to buy parts. Now, Eclipse has 286 aircraft in service around the world. They currently have orders for 15 aircraft, and they're already making plans to be able to deliver up to 50 aircraft a year by 2024. 
Now, this is the second bankruptcy for Eclipse. It was liquidated in 2008 after a long period of losing money on each aircraft delivered. Its assets were bought and formed the basis of the new Eclipse company. Under the plan, Klatmeyer would remain with the company, though he said there are no contracts or promises. From the Wichita Eagle newspaper at kansas.com, NetJets on Monday entered into an agreement with Textron to buy as many as 325 of the company's biggest jets. If fully exercised, the agreement would be valued at current list prices at nearly $10 billion. The agreement for options on up to 175 Cessna Citation Longitude and 150 Hemisphere Business Jets was announced by the two companies Monday on the eve of the 2018 National Business Aviation Association Convention in Orlando, Florida. Deliveries of the $26.9 million longitude would occur between the second half of 2019 through 2033. Monday's announcement also establishes NetJets as the launch customer for the Hemisphere. That's a 19-passenger jet that would be Cessna's largest and longest range at 4,500 nautical miles. Earlier this year, Textron CEO Scott Donnelly said the company was suspending development of the Hemisphere because of ongoing problems with its proposed engines, which are under development. But last month, Brad Thresh, Textron's senior VP for engineering, said that he couldn't be more confident in French engine maker Safran overcoming issues with the Silvercrest engine. Now, with the NetJets agreement, the Hemisphere program is apparently back on, though Donnelly didn't provide a timeline for its first flight or entry into service. NetJets Johnson said his company has purchased 500 Cessna citations since 1984. And what is it with some pilots and drugs? This comes from the buffalonews.com. A helicopter pilot who operates tours in Buffalo and Niagara Falls was arrested over the weekend after Buffalo police stopped him in a parking lot and found two kilos of cocaine in a bag, along with an unspecified amount of cash, according to the Erie County Sheriff's Office. Suspect was identified as Michael Campbell, 27, owner of Fly Buffalo NY from the Lancaster Regional Airport. Sheriff's official said he was returning from a trip to New York City by car when he was stopped. Investigators say he also flies helicopters in New York City. The arrest follows a two-month-long investigation by the Sheriff's Narcotics Unit. Police executed a search warrant for Campbell's vehicle at 1.30 a.m. on Saturday. And deputies recovered a loaded 22 caliber revolver and scales with cocaine and residue at Campbell's residence. In 2013, Campbell was hailed as a hero by New York City Press after he successfully maneuvered an emergency landing in the Hudson River with a Swedish family on board. In international news, this comes from news.sky.com, a rather bizarre possible explanation for a seaplane crash. It says that a seaplane crash that killed a British family of five may have been caused by one of them accidentally knocking the pilot unconscious. That claim was made by Jerry Schwartz, who's recently become a partner at Sydney Seaplanes. He told the Australian newspaper, quote, The investigation has shown that safety is good and it's actually believed to not be pilot error. The current belief is the passenger at the front actually knocked out the pilot. The newspaper reported the passenger may have accidentally struck the pilot in the head while moving his arm to take photos of the Hawkesbury River. The group was on a New Year's Eve fly dine sightseeing tour to Rose Bay in Sydney Harbor last year when the de Havilland DHC-2 Beaver float plane flew dramatically off course before diving into Jerusalem Bay north of Sydney. Preliminary report by the Australian Transport Safety Bureau found there were no mechanical defects in the plane, the pilot was well qualified, and the plane's maintenance checks were up to date. Full report is due next year, and there is also likely to be an inquest in Australia. And I will note that occasionally there are some bizarre things where passengers do end up causing accidents. You may recall that there was a helicopter crash on the Hudson River that we talked about in New York City, in which a passenger who was moving in the front seat to arrange his feet so that they could be included in a photograph accidentally hit the fuel shutoff valve, uh, which caused that aircraft to crash. Also in international news comes a story that was just published by aviation-safety.net regarding a Gulfstream G-150 business jet, which had a fatal accident in Catalia Airport in Finland. It arrived at that airport in the afternoon of June 2nd of 2018, and the next planned flight was a positioning flight on January the 4th. The captain opened the door, at which time the cabin assistant entered the cabin. The captain and the co-pilot placed their flight bags behind the cockpit and went back outside co-pilot placed the air crew's baggage into the rear baggage compartment, which opens from the outside. Following this, the captain went into the cockpit and started the APU, which generates electricity for aircraft systems and bleed air for heating the cabin. 
The co-pilot began to brush off the snow that had fallen on the aircraft. Due to the extreme cold, which was minus 22 degrees C, the captain went back inside to fetch a pair of gloves. When he came out, he closed the door to the aircraft. A little later, the cabin assistant inside the cabin felt strange pressure in her ears and chest. She went into the cockpit and attempted to get the attention of the pilots working outside by knocking on the window. The pilots noticed the knocking, and the captain went to open the door. According to the co-pilot's observation, it was unusually difficult for the captain to get the door open. Then the captain pulled harder on the door handle, at which time the door blew open with excessive force, hitting the captain who was standing underneath the door and knocking him to the ground. The pressure wave also knocked the co-pilot down, who had been standing approximately one meter from the left side of the door. The captain died as a result of the serious injuries he sustained at the site of the occurrence. The co-pilot had not sustained any physical injuries. The cabin assistant had bruises on her right arm and continued to feel chest pain and was diagnosed with a mild concussion. The cabin sustained substantial damage. The cockpit's aft left bulkhead and the cabin's forward left bulkhead were nearly torn off. The probable cause says, one, when the aircraft is parked outside for a longer period, some pilots may close the outflow valve to prevent the ingestion of contaminants into the valve or upstream into the cabin. Two, when the APU is being run, one must check the outflow valve is fully open. If it is not possible to ensure that the valve is open or to remove differential pressure by other means, the door must not be closed. And three, the door had no indication warning of excessive cabin pressure, nor an opening for depressurization. The cabin was pressurized because the APU bleeder was ducted into the cabin, the outflow valve was closed, and the door was also closed. Significant differential pressure existed between the cabin and the outside. From flyer.co.uk comes word that MagniX is testing a new electric motor. MagniX is now planning to scale up the power unit to 750 horsepower for use on a Cessna Caravan, replacing the standard Pratt & Whitney PT6 turboprop engine. MagniX is going for an all-electric platform, saying that their 50-kilogram motor produces 5 kilowatts of power per kilogram of weight. German rival Siemens has produced a similarly powerful unit, also putting out 5 kilowatts per kilogram, and is aiming for 10 kilowatts per kilogram within two years. MagniX was founded nine years ago in Australia and recently moved its headquarters to Redmond, Washington in the U.S. Their new CEO, Roy Gonzarski, said MagniX's motor should cost roughly the same as the Pratt & Whitney PT6, while improving operating costs by 40 to 60 percent, because obviously electricity is cheaper than Jet A fuel that the PT6 burns. Gonzarski says MagniX's motor will allow loaded caravans to fly up to 105 miles using existing lithium-ion battery technology. That range could increase to 250 miles within a few years as battery technology improves. Now, we interviewed the CEO of MagniX on the Airplane Geeks podcast last week in episode 524. Uh, so if you didn't catch that, you might want to check it out. By the way, I'd like to announce that the Airplane Geeks podcast will be on hiatus for two weeks. So there won't be a new episode this week or next week, but we should have new episodes out starting the following week. And more engine news. This again comes from flyer.co.uk. A revolutionary hybrid electric combustion aircraft engine is being developed by Austria's Scale Wings Group, best known for its Mustang replica SW51. Quote, the groundbreaking concept of the multiple redundant aircraft engine consisted in its standard configuration of three interlocking engines of which two work on the basis of efficient two-cylinder four-stroke injection engines. The third drive in the form of a high-performance state-of-the-art electric motor delivers enormous additional performance as required or can also be used for noise protection for acceleration, takeoff, and climbing to cruising altitude. The special aircraft engine integrates in the standard design three completely independent functioning drive units in one engine block. Should a module fail, flight can continue unhindered with the two remaining components. The Scale Wings engine exists as a concept at the moment, and development work to produce it will start next year and is expected to take three years. Now, a representative for the company, Schwoller, said that a 2x2 two two cylinder naturally aspirated engine would have 180 horsepower. An electric unit with 58 kilowatts of power plus the 2x2 two two, uh, cylinder naturally aspirated engine would give you a total of 260 horsepower. And the 2x2 two two, uh, cylinder turbo engine plus electric unit would give you 350 horsepower. 
rather fascinating concept. They say the start of engine development is planned for mid-2016. So this is going to be really something to have uh, multiple independent uh, engines all combined together in a single block. Interesting idea. Well, the next time someone from Air Canada says hi, it might be a question and not just a friendly greeting. This comes from thestar.com, a newspaper in Ottawa. It says airlines impose cannabis ban on pilots and cabin crew. And this article says, don't even think about flying high. That's the rule Canada's airlines have laid down for pilots, mechanics, and other frontline personnel in advance of Wednesday's legalization of recreational marijuana use. Air Canada, WestJet, and Jazz are among the carriers that have imposed a blanket ban on cannabis use for many employees directly involved in flight operations as Transport Canada warns that cannabis is, quote, a potential threat to aviation safety. Quote, employees working in safety-critical areas at the company, including flight operations and aircraft maintenance, will be prohibited from using cannabis and cannabis products at all times, both on-duty and off-duty, according to Air Canada spokesperson Peter Fitzpatrick in an email released on Monday. That includes those in the air, such as pilots and flight attendants, and personnel on the ground involved in operations such as mechanics and flight dispatchers. Other Air Canada employees will be prohibited from using cannabis while on duty or in the workplace. Quote, we are acting out of an abundance of caution based on current understanding of the effects of these drugs, including their after effects and the potential they can linger in the human system. This policy will be reviewed regularly and updated to include new information related to recreational cannabis use, according to Fitzpatrick's. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, you're going to want to hear the story of a pilot who's on track to go from zero time to 1,500 hours in an airline job in just 12 months. Plus an overview of the Piper M350, M500, and M600, and the Pilatus PC-12. Stick around. We'll be back right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And welcome back. In a moment, we'll get to our main topic. But first, let me give you a few quick updates. I want to tell you I had an aborted takeoff today. Uh, before I tell you about that, though, I want to encourage everyone as a pilot out there to always be observing other aircraft when you're on the ground, anytime you're taxiing, and for sure to speak up anytime you see something that is not quite right. Today, I was in the run-up area, and I noticed something that didn't look just right on a Cessna 152 that was holding short about to take off. So I called the tower and I told them that there appeared to be something sticking out from under the door on the right side. Well, the flight instructor immediately opened the door and pulled in what looked like the last few inches of the shoulder harness that was apparently hanging out. Now, those shoulder harnesses in early Cessnas often don't connect very well to the main uh, lap belt. And if you find uh, one of those, that's because there's this little piece of plastic uh, which is on the uh, pin that sticks out of the uh, seatbelt. And it ages over time and eventually breaks and falls off. And when it does, then the shoulder harness is just not going to connect very well. So if you have a shoulder harness buckle that keeps falling off, have your mechanic fix it. It's a relatively easy fix to put a new piece of plastic back on that. And always just keep an eye on other airplanes and let them know if something you see on the, from the outside just doesn't look quite right. Years ago, I watched a Bonanza that was pushing its tow bar as it taxied toward the runway. Now, this was a deserted airport, so I was the only only one that could have told the pilot, and I'm sure he was grateful he didn't take off and try to retract the landing gear with that tow bar attached. Now, back to that aborted takeoff. I have had a number of uh, aborted takeoffs in the recent past for you know, geese flying by over the runway or possibly for a door that was ajar, but it's really been a long time since I've aborted because of an engine that didn't sound quite right. The aircraft had just come out of maintenance, which of course is always a time to pre-flight carefully and be extra cautious during takeoff. On our takeoff roll in this uh, Cirrus SR20, I heard the engine dip in power twice, and I noticed a needle drop down to 91% power and 93% power, whereas I know that this plane always displays a constant 96% power during takeoff at our airport. So the student pilot, uh, who was fairly experienced, didn't 
pull the throttle immediately, which kind of surprised me, but I went ahead and grabbed it and pulled it off. And hopefully my demonstration uh, taught him to act a little faster in the future when he observes a problem. We then went back to the run-up area and did a full power run-up in the run-up area. And the engine showed you know, that it would, had its normal consistent 96% power. But we still went ahead and canceled the flight just so that maintenance can take a look at it. And the owner has already emailed me this evening to say that he's going to pull the data card so that he can download the data and see exactly what it was that we noticed during the takeoff. By the way, it also made me think that I'm going to change my uh, takeoff briefing. When I give a takeoff briefing, I mention in the beginning of the briefing that if the engine quits on the takeoff roll, we're going to pull the power to idle and brake, brake, brake. And it occurred to me that often the engine doesn't just quit, but instead we've got some kind of, you know, partial power loss or, you know, some type of momentary interruption. So I think I may amend my briefing in the future rather than say, you know, if the engine quits to say, hey, if the engine is at all flaky or something like that, pull the power to idle and brake. And I had a note from the FAA about a new Facebook group that they have up that you might be interested in joining. It's from the FAST team. Now, FAST team stands for FAA Safety Team. And you can find their uh, new Facebook page by uh, searching on FAST team, F-A-A-S-T-E-A-M. I'll put a link in the show notes that you can click on to find it. And I've signed up for it. And I just noticed they've posted information about a webinar. It's going to be in the evening on Wednesday, October the 17th. It's called Turning fledglings into flyers, three challenges for flight instructors. And I noticed that uh, my friend Susan Parson is one of the presenters and also Paul Prydecker. And the description says, in many ways, flight instruction is akin to compressed parenting. The instructor starts with complete responsibility for the very survival of another human being. The task is to transfer the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary for the helpless human to understand, think independently, and make sound choices to navigate the complexities the real world serves up every day. The nature of that task makes flight instruction a risky business. There are many ways to get hurt if you're not paying attention to the right things at the right time, and the long-term stakes are high, since the things you teach will affect how the trainee flies in the future. And so the presenters will be talking about three specific challenges that flight instructors face and offer tips and techniques for meeting them successfully. And if you're not able to attend the broadcast live, it says you can also access an archived version of the program afterwards. And I'll include a link to that so that you can watch this, even if you're not able to join the program live. And as I mentioned before, I am out of state every weekend here in October doing something, speaking at various events. And this week I'm leaving on Thursday to go to Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm going to be bringing back a brand new SR-22 with the owner. So uh, on Friday morning, we plan to just part from KEQY, the Charlotte Monroe Executive Airport, and we'll be heading out to Biloxi, Mississippi, where we plan to spend the night. Though I gotta say, looks like it's going to be some rainy weather toward the end of that trip and possibly some thunderstorm. So that's going to make it a little interesting and challenging. Day two, we are scheduled to leave Biloxi and go to Scottsdale, Arizona. But once again, looks like we're going to have rain toward the end of the day as we get closer to Arizona. Fortunately, this time of year, it looks like the freezing levels are still going to be relatively high up around nine, 10,000 feet or so. Uh, so going IFR shouldn't be too difficult as long as we can avoid all those thunderstorms. And if all goes according to the plan, I'll then be flying home from Scottsdale on Southwest on Saturday. So I'll let you know how this weekend goes. I'm guessing we may need to have a plan B because we just might not be able to complete one or more of these legs as we've planned them uh, due to weather. And then coming up at the end of the month, I'm going to be at the AOPA Regional Fly-In in Gulf Shores, Alabama, October 26th and 27th. I'm giving a three-hour advanced IFR seminar on that Friday. Come on down to Gulf Shores and say hello if you uh, have the opportunity. And then finally, I'm going to be in Orange, Australia, my first time ever to Australia, November 9th through 11th. I'll be at the uh, Cirrus Pilot Proficiency Program there. And I want to give a special thank you to the many people who have provided me with all kinds of suggestions for this trip for my itinerary. I think I'll be there for about 10 days. My wife will be coming along. It'll be our first time. We're looking to do uh, a lot of sightseeing and so on. So thanks to everybody who's provided ideas on what we should be doing when we're down under. Now, if you really love this show and you're looking for just a little bit more after you get done, head on out to the Patreon site. I post a lot of things there, some of which make it later into the show, but some of which don't. So check it out. Just go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. Click on blog and you can see all my posts there. 
And I'd like to thank some new Patreon supporters this week who are Chad Jensen, Steve Konevsky, who I've flown with in the past, Greg uh, Matias. Uh, he added his pledge up to $8 a month. Thank you, Greg. Eddie Ramos and Jack Downey. And I really want to thank you for your contributions and thank everyone who helps support the show in some way. Now, if you're thinking, hey, I'd like to be part of this special group of listeners who support the show, just type into a web browser, aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and you can make a contribution toward the show of as little as $2 a month, and that cost will be billed to your credit card each month. And while you're on the Patreon site, check out all the various stories that I've posted there. Now stick around in seven seconds. We're going to have a fascinating story about a person who is going from zero to airline pilot in one year, right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. So welcome back. I've got several short interviews that I did last weekend at the Cirrus Owner Pilots Association annual meeting in Las Vegas. And in fact, none of the things that we talked about are really related to Cirrus. So I think you'll find uh, these stories of interest to anyone who's a pilot or interested in general aviation. Now we're talking to another pilot here. Tell me your name. Uh, Tammy Shoulder. Tammy, you've got an interesting story. Tell me what you started doing in January this year. Well, I was just finishing up my doctorate degree. I was uh, defending my dissertation on uh, in education administration. I was bringing cockpit resource management into the classroom. And during my study, I fell in love with the idea of flying. So uh, just before I defended my dissertation, I started taking flying lessons. And tell me what uh, you're looking to do. What's your, uh, your ultimate objective here? Well, I did a lot of study uh, based on research, and I'd like to continue my study from the cockpit, and I'd like to eventually work for an airline, preferably Alaska Airlines. No, <laughs> I'd like to work for an airline and uh, just start a commercial airline. Well, so a lot of people have similar kinds of ambitions. The thing I found unique about your story is how quickly you progressed. We're sitting here in August, or no, October. Tell me how many hours you have now. I have 821 hours. <laughs> so in under 10 months, you've accumulated 800 and some hours. Tell us what you've done in the intervening uh, nine or 10 months and how you've been able to move so quickly. Yeah, so I studied really hard. I worked uh, closely with my instructor on my private. Once I got my private, it was right around that time that we purchased a Cirrus SR-22. And I've just been in love with this airplane and uh, she's taken really good care of us and and I think I have over 700 hours in her right now and <laughs> it's just been a blast. I've tackled all 50 states and uh, now my husband and I are off to uh, land in all 50 capitals. So, and Give us some of the benchmarks along the line in terms of certificates you've acquired and where you've done those check rides and things like that. Yeah, so I got my, my private pilot uh, certificate in Troutdale, Oregon, in uh, March, and then I immediately started working on my instrument rating, and as we all know, the examiners are hard to find, so I found a great one up in um, Helena, Montana. So we, I went out to Helena, and I trained there for a week, get used to that airspace, and uh, got my instrument rating in Montana, and now I'm currently working on my commercial rating all over the place. <laughs> but uh, I'm still using the same instructor. Uh, Matt's a wonderful pilot and uh, we have similar ambitions. So it's been very nice to work along somebody who has the same goals, long-term goals as I. So. It's... And when do you think you're potentially going to be ready to uh, start interviewing? Well, I, uh, my personal goal, I plan to have my commercial rating by November, and then start my CFI and uh, ATP and all the good stuff. And I hope to have 1,500 hours by my one year starting training, which is January 26th. So if I could get 15 hours, 1,500 hours by January 26th, then I'll start putting my resume out there and uh, see if I can get picked up from someone. I'm still just grinning, thinking of the idea of 1,500 hours in one calendar year. That's that's really quite an amazing uh, feat. So I'm guessing you must have used some of the things that you've learned as a college professor, kind of from a planning standpoint. How did you put this plan together to do this within a year? Well, I 
live by a calendar. So I, I mapped out how many hours I would need per week. And uh, it turns out I need about uh, six to seven hours per day. And uh, most of the time at six, six days a week, I usually try to take at least one day off. But uh, right now I'm completely obsessed with angel flights and I try to do an angel flight or two or three <laughs> in, a, in a day. Uh, just I really enjoyed getting to know all these different people and, uh, you know, just give back to this amazing, hopeful career that I plan to have in the next year. And what kind of advice or suggestions would you have for anybody who's listening and thinking, wow, I'd like to fly for the airline someday? I do it. Yeah, you know, it takes so much work. It's it's probably the hardest, most challenging thing that I've ever done in my lifetime. And I have a doctorate degree, so that was pretty tough too. But this is by far uh, a, a lot harder. But, you know, just like we tell our students coming from education, I tell my students every day, just set your goals and work towards your goals and do what it takes to, to fulfill them. Obviously, uh, traveling through 50 states, you must have had some uh, unusual encounters. To, what what uh, happened that you found uh, interesting as you were traveling around the entire United States? Well, uh, so have it. I was supposed to start out on my big adventure the day after my first instrument rating uh, appointment, but the examiner unfortunately had to cancel on me. So I started the adventure anyway, thinking, you know what, I've done enough VFR flying that I know how to read weather and I know what to avoid and what I'm not allowed to go into. So I set out on my adventure. And uh, that morning that I was supposed to leave at six o'clock in the morning, the clouds chose 9.30 in the morning for me. <laughs> so uh, once the overcast lifted and I was able to fly out of, out of Ramona, California, I was, uh, my first target was Arlington, Texas, where my son is, and so that was going to be my first destination. But the thunderstorms that I was hoping to avoid by leaving early did form, and uh, I had to do quite the diversion around them to uh, get to Arlington. But, you know, I you have to just be flexible in aviation, as we know. So where I, you know, the time that I was supposed to go into Florida, I didn't get to go into Florida because a line of thunderstorms that kept me out of there. So we just have to, like I said, we have to be flexible and uh, weather is our friend. We respect the weather <laughs> and uh, it's just not worth taking any big chances. So Definitely not. Now, your husband came by earlier and was telling me about all the things that you're doing. Uh, and he obviously flies for a very major uh, carrier. What's his involvement been in the process? He, he has been such an amazing encourager. He's also been this open book encyclopedia that I get to ask <laughs> questions. Uh, it's, it's really been amazing kind of going through that whole learning experience that he's talked about for so many years to me. Uh, I never really quite understood until I actually have gone through it. So, uh, I, I, like I said, I mean, it, it is one of the most challenging things I've ever done in my lifetime. So, uh, but at the same time, it's so rewarding, you know, when you, when, it, when I, the first time I got to file an IFR solo was pretty, uh, pretty rewarding. It just really felt good, you know, that, that I could be learning how to fly an airplane. I just, it did, it's still kind of surreal to me, um, but it's, it's definitely worth the, the time that he's, he's been an amazing support. I can't thank him enough. Well, you've got a huge smile on your face. Are you having the time of your life? Absolutely. Absolutely. All 821 hours. Well, there might have been some tears in there a couple times, <laughs> but it's been, it's been amazing. I, I, can't think of doing anything else right now. It's it, This is definitely uh, what I am supposed to be doing right now, especially with Angel Flights. <laughs> Again, I mean, it's just such an awesome organization. I'm not really trying to give a commercial right now on them, but I, uh, I really have appreciated what they were doing, and I am so happy to be a part of that. And it's, it's kind of given me purpose to my hours, and um, that feels really good. Well, you're on an amazing trajectory. I have no doubt that you're going to be hired sometime next year. Have a great fun, and thanks for talking with us. Absolutely. Thank you. It was, it was fun.
Wow, what a fun way to get prepared for an airline career flying to all 50 states. Plus, I think that experience probably is going to serve her very well in the future, and I bet she's going to have multiple offers. So, Tammy, good luck to you. Now, here's an interesting story about flight simulators. And someone I've flown with before has just walked up. Tell everybody your name and what you fly. Hi, my name is Ray Sanchez Pescador, and I fly a 2004 G2 SR-22. And you were telling me about flight simulators. Tell people how you use them and why you think they're important. Well, one of my challenges is that I live in the Pacific Northwest and in Ashland in the Rogue Valley, and we are typically grounded for much of the winter because of icing levels and cloud cover. And I do not have a Fiki airplane, so I have spent a lot of time on the ground looking up, wishing I was there. And when I start flying again in the spring, I find that the buttonology is sometimes a little bit rusty. And so to remedy that, we've purchased a Fly the Sim simulator. And during the winter times, I have the opportunity to go there and practice. Practice approaches, practice takeoffs, practice all the, all the flying the airplane. And it obviously, because it has the same configuration as my airplane, the buttonology stays in my mind. And I even discover things that I didn't really know or know that well um, about my airplane. Um, and so the beauty of that is that when I get back into flying actively in the April, you know, March, April timeframe, I am still much, much, much more fluid in terms of the buttonology than if I hadn't done it. And so I find that extremely useful for, for folks um, so that, that get grounded for long periods of time. Now, that's great. So tell folks about what kind of hardware that involves and what the setup looks like for the simulator, how much it costs, and so on. Well, the simulator that I got is the VX, I believe, the Fly the Sim VX, which has the three main screens, not the monster screens, but the three main screens on top. And, of course, includes all the uh, Cirrus uh, models that, that are available for the simulator, includes all the perspectives, the, the, the Avidines. I don't know about Aspens, but they've got all those threes. And, and, and so it's very easy to adjust the, 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 or choose the right airplane to fly that. Now, we bought this, and I decided to install this um, at, the, at our local FBO because I wanted to have the opportunity to share this with, with other folks that fly other different kinds of airplanes. So we purchased it with a Piper package and the Cirrus package, and I think we paid something around, oh, I want to say $11,000 for it, uh, all said and done, uh, because we have a commercial license because we want to be able to essentially make it available to to student pilots as well as to instructors that are also grounded during the winter. And so they have the opportunity to continue their revenue streams and, and teach while otherwise they would just be sitting at the airport looking outside and saying, well, we can't fly today, so class is canceled. <laughs> so that's I thought it might be an interesting model. We're still testing the model, but it's it's there. Well, and it sounds like you also get some income from that as well. How is that uh, structured well, the FBO gets most of the income because obviously they host it, they, they administer the, the, the logins and the permissions and all that kind of stuff. Um, so for, we're not doing it for the cash, we're really actually doing it to make, help people be safer, I guess. This is the one way to, do, to look at it. And it sounds like you feel like it makes you safer too. It makes, it's made me a lot safer. Uh, when I go on a trip that uh, to an unfamiliar airport, I can practice the approaches beforehand. I can actually fly the the, the area VFR to see what the terrain looks like, uh, and then go back to IFR and shut everything down and try to fly the approach with an IFR with not seeing anything out the window. And so it's it gives you the comfort level that you know what to expect. That's great. So that sounds like it's helping to, to make you safe and others safe as well. That's fantastic. Well, Ray, thanks so much for coming by and telling everybody about this. Oh, thank you. Now, the simulators that Ray is referring to come from flythissim.com. And by total coincidence, I was talking with the head of that company, Roland Pinto, at the very end of the show. And we talked about a lot of different topics. Interesting guy. So next up, we're going to be talking about angle of attack and night flying. I'm talking with Arthur Gunn. And Arthur, tell us what kind of aircraft you fly. Fly 2006, uh, 22 normal aspirated. And you were just telling me that you recently added angle of attack and you're using it in a way that I thought was kind of interesting. Tell folks about that. So my wife and I went on vacation to Hawaii and uh, met up with uh, Lawrence Balter, 
uh, from Maui uh, Aviators. And he kind of gave me a ground school and introduction to AOA. And one of the things he did was spent five laps in the pattern. And the first, and he had the PFD off. So first time what I did is use the angle of attack, cross-checked with the backup airspeed indicator, and I got comfortable, and we did a bunch of landings with the PFD off. So that sold me. So we had an AOA, an Alpha Systems AOA, uh, the Eagle with the uh, Valkyrie heads up, put in our airplane. And I really don't like night flying. I'm not bad taking off, I'm not bad in cruise, I'm not bad in descent, but when I get close to landing, I get a little bit nervous because my depth perception, I feel, is not what it should be at night. So we put this angle of attack indicator with the heads up, and you know, when you have it in the blue donut, your approach speed is correct, and it really manages your flying the wing, not the, air, not the airspeed. So that gave me an extra level of comfort when I'm coming in to my approach. I'm an instrument pilot, I set up an ILS or what have you if I can, and that gave me situa situational awareness, the blue donut uh, got me down, I've got little presty high beams on the plane, and when I was close and I could see the runway and whatnot, that's when I'd start my flare, made perfect landings, I love it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've heard a lot about angle of attack indicators, hadn't heard about people using them at night, but it makes total sense. What is the kind of the cost to have it installed, and tell folks a little bit about how would it warn you if you were at the, the wrong angle of attack? Well, one of the big things is they use chevrons. So you're in cruise, it's a green chevron, uh, yellow, and then you do yellow with half donut. And then when you get to your half donut, you're at um, 1.3 VSO. And then if you exceed your angle attack, you'll get red, and then you'll get a major red chevron. So like, for example, when you flare and you just stall it when you're landing, I mean, it's the red chevron's up there. So that's how it warns you. And the oral alerts as well? We actually didn't put in the oral alerts because it drives us nuts when you get the traffic, traffic, traffic on your, on your traffic watch. So we decided to disable that function. And roughly what was the cost of that installed? It was about 12 hours of installation. And we have the heat, heated pedo and a couple other things. It's about 5,900, 5,800 bucks. Well worth it. Excellent. So th has this given you more confidence flying at night? It has. You know, it's easy to fly the plane, take off and whatnot. It's getting it down that's the challenge for some uh, people that don't fly at night a lot. And it just gives you that added situational awareness where you're flying, what your speeds are, etc. Arthur, thanks so much. That's great information. Thanks, Max. Well, angle of attack indicators used to be so expensive, they were used only by the military, but they've come way down in cost. I know you can buy some for under $1,000, so definitely a good uh, safety tool to add to any cockpit. Next up, there were a couple of different aircraft on display, and the first one I sat in the back of was this brand new version of the Meridian, the Piper M600. <laughs> I'm sitting here talking with R.D. Wooten from Keystone Aviation. And R.D., tell us what we're sitting in here. We're in the Piper M600, recently new design for Piper. It started in uh, mid-year, or actually the third quarter of uh, 2016 were the first deliveries. And uh, by the end of this year, we'll have delivered 100 airplanes. So we were talking a few minutes ago when you were talking about the, the different uh, kind of cabin class uh, Pipers. If you would just uh, give people a general uh, layout for what those models are and what they cost and what some of the key differences are. Well, in 2015, Piper decided to uh, rename all the airplanes. M class is how we refer to them, but we have the M350, the M500, and the M600. The cabin arrangement on all three of the airplanes is pretty much exactly the same. The differences lies in engines. You know, the M350 is a piston-powered engine, has a Lycoming uh, 350 horsepower engine, hence the M350 version. The M500 is a Pratt & Whitney turboprop that's 500 horsepower, and the M600 is a Pratt & Whitney, again, that's 600 horsepower. So the name of the airplane kind of tells you what the horsepower is on the airplane itself. And if someone is currently flying a Cirrus or a Beechcraft or a Mooney and they're thinking about stepping up to a cabin class aircraft like this, what, what's kind of the number one main benefit that they, they get from doing this? 
probably the first thing is the pressurization. So you get rid of the, you know, the oxygen mass makes it much easier for your passengers and, you know, they're less apprehensive, you know, not having to wear that mask over their face or the cannulas in their nose. So that'd be the first thing. The second one, it is a cabin class airplane. So the, you know, the back four seats and are in a club seating arrangement. Uh, you've got a nice table. Uh, all the newer model airplanes come with all the electronic conveniences. You know, you got place to plug in your iPad, to, you know, both power it and to play your music through the headphone system that's in the airplane. So there's also separate 120 um, volt power outlets to, you know, power other things that, uh, you know, need electrical power. Yeah, I think we'll wait for that one to pass. <laughs> We are, after all, at an airport, and they do have airplanes. Uh, so tell me about some of the other kinds of features you would find on aircraft in this class. It's more of a all-weather airplane, and, you know, it has a full de-ice, which, you know, in the industry it's referred to as FIKI, so it's flight into known icing approved. It has onboard radar. It also has the XM satellite radar as well so between the two of them you get a much clearer picture of you know what what you're looking at out in the distance using the xm and then to actually navigate you know around it or through it if need be then you can use the onboard radar for that it's much more accurate than xm weather is in your exact spot that you are at the exact time so what kind of altitudes and speeds would people be likely flying at in the different models we just talked about well, the M350, it's certified to 25,000 feet, and it's the piston version. So you'll typically fly it in the high teens. If there's a weather issue and you want to get on top, then you can go on up to the, you know, 25,000, 24,000. But typically you're going to fly at, you know, 18 to 20. Uh, you're going to see roughly 200 knots. Uh, you'll have 1,000 plus miles range with it. The M500, it's certified to uh, 30,000, but with RVSM, you're basically going to fly it at 28 or below. And the sweet spot for it, it's a turboprop, is, you know, in the 25, 26,000 range. And you're going to see, you know, in the neighborhood of 270 knots with it. And you've got, you know, 750 miles at high speed cruise. And if you want to go to long range cruise, you can get it out to 1,000 miles. The M600 is altitudes are pretty much the same it's certified to 30 no rvsm though so 28 is what you're limited to here in the states you'll fly that airplane again 25 26 thousand because that gives you a good cabin altitude of about you know roughly seven thousand feet so that's pretty comfortable for most people just sitting and it does 270 knots plus you know full of fuel it's a 1500 nautical mile range if you're going to carry more in the cabin, you can carry a thousand pounds in the cabin and go a thousand miles with it and still have an hour reserve on top of that. So, And for someone who's stepping up to one of these aircraft from some of the models I mentioned earlier, what would they expect for a typical transition time and uh, training experience? And is that included in the price of a new airplane? The training is included for uh, transition training. So legacy Flight Training is our provider, and they have offices in Vero Beach and also in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. So you get, it's roughly a one-week course, and then you'll, depending on your time that you have already in your Cirrus or other airplanes, um, it's kind of insurance-driven. But if you're a, a you know, between a 500, 750-hour total time pilot and uh, have an instrument rating, then you're probably going to need 25 hours, between 25 to a maximum of 50 of what they refer to, refer to as a mentor time that, uh, so you get used to, you know, especially if you go into the turboprop version, how to operate the engine, which actually it's simpler than a piston, but you know, the insurance companies don't look at it. They just look at it from the dollar and cent standpoint, it costs a whole lot more. So Indeed. So I'm looking at three large displays here, and it looks like a couple of touchscreen controllers below it. What type of avionics do we have here in this uh, M600? The M600 has a G3000 system in it, where the other two airplanes have the uh, G1000 NXI system in them. So 
it's a relatively, if you're used to Garmin, it's not a, you know, a difficult transition. It's a, but M600 with the G3000, it's a touchscreen controller. So if you've been using a, a GTN 750 or 650, then, you know, adapting to this is pretty simple. Yes, I recognize the G3000, same cockpit in the uh, Cirrus jet that I just did my type rate again. So kind of fun to see we've got a jet class uh, avionics here in this. So tell me a little bit about uh, pricing and where do people find out more about Keystone Aviation? Well, pricing the M350, the piston version, it's generally million four fifty is, you know, nicely equipped. There's uh, the M500 is going to be in the 2-2 two, two range, uh, fully equipped, and then the... Uh, M600 will be a little over 3 million, 3.1 range, fully equipped. Keystone, you know, it's like everything else in the world today. It's www.keystoneaviation.com or piper.com is another source for information on the airplanes. Hardy, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. Hey, I've enjoyed it. Thanks, Max. And next up, I sat in a Pilatus PC-12. Now, that's a real workhorse of an aircraft. I see these fly in and out of my home airport all the time. They're being used for charter, and also some private individuals own them as well. And here's that interview. So I'm sitting here talking with Brett Woods. Brett, tell us who you're with and what we're sitting in right now. I am with Western Aircraft, which is a dealer for Pilatus aircraft. So we are currently sitting in the cabin of a Pilatus PC-12. It's a brand new airplane. It's got about 35 hours on it total time. And I can smell the leather seats back here. It really uh, smells nice as new. So for folks who maybe fly things like Moonies and Cirrus and things like that, what's uh, what are the big differences when you step up to an aircraft like this? Mainly it's the size and comfort and, and, and really capability of the airplane. We're talking about a single engine turboprop airplane, which is in reality, people think these are more complicated to fly. But if you actually get behind a, a single engine turboprop, you find that it's usually easier to fly than the Cirrus and the Mooney and the Beechcraft. It can seem intimidating, but we really just encourage people to get in them and fly them. And then as far as just cabin capacity, it is a large airplane that honestly flies like a 182. So you can load up the cabin. For instance, I came down here, this whole thing was loaded up. Didn't do a weight and balance. Not because I'm a, I'm a maverick, because you just don't need to do it in the PC-12. That's the beauty of it. it. It will fly. You've got so much weight capacity, you just don't worry about it anymore. So let's go back to it being simpler to fly. I'm sure a lot of people wonder, why is that? So, so tell us about that. So this is a the single engine turboprop, and, and I guess just turboprops in general in the early 80s were rather complex. There was a lot going on. You had to, to manually turn on boost pumps and all of the things that happened. But as technology has advanced, they've really simplified things to now. It is literally a push one button, watch the airplane start. You, of course, sit there and monitor in case something goes wrong to shut it down. But that's it. Then once it's started, there is one lever. It is a go stop lever. And there's zero concern about shock cooling or cylinder head temperatures. There's none of that. You've got one temperature. It's a turbine inlet temperature. And on most modern turboprops, they're derated to where they're nowhere near their max temperature. And so at this point, especially in the PC-12, you're running about 780 degrees and you've got so much margin where the same engine is running in other applications much, much hotter. The beauty of that is you really can't hurt the engine. It's just, it's, it's really, I mean, for lack of a better term, it's, it's pilot proof. You can't hurt the airframe. So first, tell me about uh, how much horsepower you've got under the hood there. And also, a few moments ago, you were telling me that you could probably put this into a shorter field than many Cirrus pilots are comfortable. To, uh, tell us why that is. So this is this is 1,800 shaft horsepower derated to 1,245. So you, you effectively have 1,245 shaft horsepower all the way up to altitude. This airplane, that I mentioned before, kind of flies like a 182, but the beauty of the airplane is that it's very forgiving. So you do fly at low speeds. When you come across the numbers, you put it down, and first of all, you're flying slow, but you have beta. That's a, that's a characteristic of a turboprop in that you can go into beta and then full reverse, and you can get it stopped in about 1,000 feet. So I can stop this airplane in 1,000 feet all day long, and it's not really a challenge. I'm not, I'm not pushing the airframe. That's something that is important to understand that while it may seem intimidating, this big, uh, big airplane, it's really easy to fly. And, and those short airstrips, they really aren't a challenge anymore. That's, that's the nice thing about the airplane. So give us a few specs in terms of number of people, how high you fly, how fast. So it's a pressurized airplane. Typically, it likes to hang out around 225,000, so flight level 250, certified up to 300, but the airplane's happy about 250. 
The reality is it's it's got right now the airplane we're sitting in, it's got six seats in the back of it. So eight seats total. That's two up front. You can put up to eight seats in the back and it's a no nonsense airplane. You can actually load up eight people in the airplane, two more people up front. You can put 10 people in the airplane. You're still going to go around 1500 miles with that much of a load. And what do you have for avionics up front? It's a Honeywell Apex. So it was specifically designed. So the Apex is an offshoot of, of Honeywell. They designed it for the PC-12. It's the same avionics platform that's now in the PC-24, which is the Pilatus jet. Uh, they call that the ACE system, but it's uh, basically the same backbone of the system. And how does it price out and what kind of options would typically uh, people consider? So the airplane we're sitting in today is priced at $5,034,000. Um, Pilatus does package pricing like most uh, manufacturers do. What that includes is a six plus two option. So you can go the executive, six executive seats in the back plus two option, two more seats. And then you've got the premium avionics. So really most airplanes from about 2011 on are priced and equipped pretty similarly because they went to the, the, the package options, which are more economical to do. So everybody pretty much has executive six plus twos and premium avionics, and they're all about the same. And the music is coming in through a very large opening in the back. Tell people about that, because I think that's unique to the Pilatus. Yeah, so the PC-12 standard has the cargo door, and it's a very large cargo door that is big enough to load a full-size pallet. Actually, the intention of the airplane was supposed to be a, just a cargo military transport, um, and eventually they figured out they have a gold mine here as far as executive travel, but the cargo door stayed there. And the beauty of it is a straight wing. You can literally load a pallet. We've helped people load motorcycles and snowmobiles, um, whatever you want, the sky's the limit, literally. But the the thing is that it's just so big that people don't even realize it's there. And of course, like I said, it is standard. It's not an option. It's just, it's part of the PC-12. It's what makes it unique. Well, unique except for the PC-24. Except for the PC-24. The PC-24 has, it's a jet with a cargo door. That's, that's one of the things that Pilatus learned early on is that how much utility people are getting out of that. And if they're going to make a jet, it better be able to get in the same place as the PC-12 will. And not only that, it needs to do the same thing. So that means it means a large cargo door. So let's talk about folks who might be uh, thinking about stepping up and training. How many hours would they probably want uh, to have? Uh, I mean, what would an insurance company be looking for? And what kind of transition training would be required? The reality is, so insurance companies are going to, they, they, they tell you what it is. And, and the lowest time we've seen from somebody stepping out of a Cirrus is around 50 hours. But I would say it's anywhere from 50 to 150, just depending on the amount of time you have. What they want to see is just you get some experience with pressurization and the turboprop because, like I said before, it is actually a lot easier to fly than a piston airplane, but at the same time, the dollar values are so high that the insurance company needs to protect themselves, so they will require that. And what we recommend for most people is just, honestly, it's it's getting the airplane. You can sit left seat and hire a mentor for that time because it's the best money you're ever going to spend. You'll learn a lot, and it's really, really not that hard, but insurance requires that amount of hours. So before we wrap up, tell me a little bit about the Pilatus business model in general. It's it's interesting working uh, as a dealership for Pilatus because uh, we we almost always will sell out of airplanes. We don't have them. And the, and the reason being is that Pilatus is very aware of, of supply and demand. They make a limited amount of airplanes, and, and almost every single year we're, we're begging for more airplanes. But the reality is Pilatus is privately held, no debt. And they can they can afford to make less airplanes and make a more demand uh, uh, more more demand in the market. The beauty of that is that when you look at a five year old airplane, we've got about an eighty five percent residual value. And a ten year old airplane, we've got an eighty percent residual value. And I was just talking about the the early models are actually selling for more than what they sold for originally. And it's 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 a very unique to the market in that you can look at new versus used. And typically, someone will come to me and say, you know, I want to buy a three to four year old airplane because I don't want to take that original depreciation hit. It's true on most airplanes, but on a Pilatus, because of their model, it actually will cost less to buy the new airplane, which is kind of baffling to think of, you know, something with an engine that, that holds its value that way. But it's, it's simply true. And that's by design. Pilatus did it intentionally because they figured out if we can keep the value of the older airplanes high. People are going to buy new airplanes and it's worked out very, very well for them. So where can people go to find out more about Pilatus and also to contact you, Brett, if they're interested in buying one? So I am with the, the dealership. I said Western Aircraft is an authorized dealer for Pilatus. There, there are dealers throughout the world uh, and throughout the company. But if you go to PilatusAircraft.com, uh, you can go there and see the list of dealers. And the, the beauty is we all work together. It's not like I'm competing against other dealerships. Pilatus has created a very good niche of dealers that, you know, I, I, we all want to help out. And it's all about creating happy customers because that helps sell more airplanes. That's fantastic. Brett, thanks so much for your time today. All right. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. 
Always interesting talking to pilots at the different shows. Hope you enjoyed that. Coming up next, listener feedback and questions right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Uh, welcome back. Here is some feedback from a couple of listeners regarding episode 68, in which we talked about the impossible turn. Of course, that's trying to turn back to the runway after having an engine failure shortly after takeoff. This comes from Paul in Ottawa, Illinois. Paul says, as a middle-aged aspiring pilot, I find resources like your podcast valuable in helping me develop critical thinking in the cockpit. You've said numerous times that no two flights are the same and that good pilots are always learning. Now, he includes a link to an airplane crash in here, and he says, while I do not delight in the tragedy of this incident, I'm grateful for the timeliness of the topic. My instructor also is adverse to practicing the impossible turn at low altitude. And the crash he referenced in the article occurred at the Truckee Airport, where coincidentally I was yesterday doing a mountain checkout flight with somebody in the morning. And uh, this particular accident I had heard about, but I didn't realize until I read the link that apparently this pilot did try and turn back to the runway and uh, crash. So, Paul, thanks for sending that. And one of our Patreon supporters, Wade Jackson, sends a note that says, I find myself eagerly awaiting for each of your next episodes. In the meantime, I'm enjoying previous episodes and reading articles. Two topics I've heard you talk about are the impossible turn and also the importance to be prepared to do a go around if things are not quite right. It is possible that your advice may just save my life one day and I've changed my perspective on the impossible turn. And now each time I fly a different strip, I find myself going over where I will put down straight ahead unless I'm at a minimum of a thousand feet above the ground. Keep up the good work. Congratulations on the vision jet type rating. Yep. A really good point. And I think Wade, I probably mentioned in that particular show that as I'm taking off from uh, my home airport at Palo Alto, I'm constantly evaluating at every, uh, you know, hundred feet or so where I'm going to go. So for example, just as I reach the end of the runway, there is a possibility of making a, a left turn to land on the golf course to the left. <laughs> That's just a very, very short opportunity. Uh, then immediately after that, it's going to be an opportunity to turn slightly to the right. Uh, after that, it's going to be land more or less straight ahead. After that, if I can make it over the high tension tower wires, then there's going to be another slight right to uh, land me on the little hard strip of uh, land right next to the, uh, the San Francisco Bay. So yeah, it pays to think about all these things in advance. And now here's a listener question related to episode 75, where we talked about mental health and the aircraft that was stolen in Seattle. This is Jim in Montgomery, Alabama. In view of the recent incident at SeaTac, is there any provision to physically stop an aircraft on the ground that is not responding to ATC? I suppose that would be especially in Class Bravo or Class Charlie airports. Thanks. Jim, thanks for your question. No, I don't think most airports have a plan for dealing with uh, immobilizing a rogue aircraft that's not following ATC instructions. I think they rely instead on security to try and keep unauthorized people from boarding and commandeering an aircraft. Now, obviously, the big hole in that strategy is that someone with authorized access, like an airport employee, might be able to steal an aircraft, as happened at Seattle this past summer. Now, I asked my friend Jennifer, that's her handle on Twitter, about this. So she works at a major Midwest airport, and she said that she wasn't aware of any contingency plans for stopping rogue aircraft. Now, she and I did hypothesize that if airport operations knew in advance, they might be able to put a heavy snowplow truck or something like that behind an aircraft to keep it from being pushed back, but that once it was on the move, it would be harder to stop. Now, your question did remind me of an attempted hijacking at the Baltimore airport way back in 1974. And now, that hijacking was foiled when a police officer fired a 357 Magnum through the aircraft door window, wounding the hijacker. But prior to that, police officers tried to shoot out the tires of the aircraft to prevent it from being pushed back and taking off. But here's what I remember and why I went back to look up this story. The 38 caliber bullets they fired from the Smith & Wesson revolvers failed to penetrate the tires of the aircraft. In fact, they ricocheted off and some of them hit the wing of the aircraft. So trying to shoot out the tires of an aircraft might not be as viable a strategy as you might think to stop an airplane, at least not with lower caliber bullets. 
Now, as I was researching this, I did run across a story that I don't remember. Apparently, back in June of 1972, there was a hijacking going on at the St. Louis airport with a 727, somebody who was doing a copycat hijacking of the famous uh, D.B. Cooper uh, hijacking. And in that particular case, there was a 30-year-old businessman named David Hanley who was watching this on live television. He got so angry that he decided to drive his 1971 Cadillac at 80 miles an hour through two airport fences. He traveled down the runway at high speed, and he did crash into the nose gear of the plane, which had begun to taxi. Now, the demolished car lodged under the fuselage and under one wing. Hanley suffered multiple injuries and was charged with willfully damaging a civil aircraft. And the hijacker, well, he transferred to a new 727 while hiding among the hostages, and they bailed out of the plane over Indiana. The full loot bag and the gun were discovered by searchers and fingerprints on them led to the hijacker, who, by the way, was paroled in 2010, which means he served 38 years in prison. And I'm sure if listeners know of any contingency plans at airports for disabling aircraft, they'll let us know and I'll pass that along. Hey, if you have a question you'd like to answer it on the show, please go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on a listener question, and you can record your question, which I'll play on the show. And if you think that someday you might buy a new or slightly used Cirrus, hey, please contact me now. I can help arrange a free demo flight if you're thinking about a new Cirrus and help you understand the many factors in trying to decide between buying new or used. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the world. And if you could help me out with just one thing, please take a moment to think of one or two friends you think might enjoy the show. And then later today, contact them, tell them about the show. That's the way most people find out about the podcast, because someone like you took a moment to tell them about the show. And if they're not familiar with what a podcast is, just send them to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store if they've got an Android phone and search for Aviation News Talk and download our dedicated app. Until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. 